Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca. Today, I'll be talking about Aglo um, and what we can learn from the map makers of the 1930s about data protection today. Now, the click is not working right now. If it's not one thing, it's another. That's fine. No. Oh, wait. Hold on. There we go. So a little bit about me. So this is me at work. Um, I'm a security consultant. Uh, I work at Assurance. I'm also a Python developer. Um, I've worked in product previously, um, and now I work as obviously a security consultant. Um, I really, really enjoy the concept of canaries. Um, they're very much underutilized. Um, and yeah, so I did talk on it, so hopefully you get something out of it. So a really important thing uh, is that solution may not work for your organization. Um, security isn't a one size fits all. Um, canaries might work for you, they might not, and either or, it's fine. Um, but I always encourage people to at least have a look, give it a shot, and see if you can deploy them. Um, because, yeah, you could learn something about your data. Um, you could learn something about your infrastructure. There's a whole lot of things that you can learn if you just give it a try. So paper towns. Um, they're basically towns or locations that appear on maps, but they don't actually exist. Um, there are lots of examples of these. Um, they were created to stop pirates from stealing maps because the problem with maps is they describe what is. And so if one company makes a map and another one copies it, you can't really prove that it's actually theft because, well, we're describing the same area. Um, and so what a lot of places do is they add paper towns um, to basically show that this is only on our map if it appears on someone else's, that means you've taken it from us because it only belongs on ours. Um, and there are many examples of this. Um, they've also had a few removed from Google, um, but they don't mention that. So Aglo New York is one of these examples. Um, it was created by um, the company, the drafting paper company, I believe they were called. Um, and it was added to basically stop pirates. Um, and we'll get into the history of that. So in 1909, the, the general drafting company was founded by Otto G. Lindbergh. Um, and his assistant, Ernest Alper, um, they basically came up with this anagram, Aglo. Um, and they added it to a map. And it was just like this little dirt road intersection. It's very underwhelming to look at, even if you look at it today. Um, and basically, yeah, if, if anyone is familiar with the New York area, um, it's near Rockland, Horton, um, in that sort of area. But there's absolutely nothing there. It's empty fields. Um, so funny story is that a general store was built on that intersection um, and given the name the Aglo General Store because it was on the ESO maps. And ESO at the time were being given their maps by um, the general map company. That's why they built this store there, because they're like, this town exists, we'll build a store, people will come, we'll make lots of money. Cool. <laughs> Easy. So in an unknown year, a competing company called Rand McNally also added Aglo to their maps. That doesn't sound right. So of course, obviously, there was piracy. Someone is stealing our maps. The difference is, is that they were getting their map details from the county collection. Um, and at the time, a store exists. So the town existed. So you couldn't actually prove piracy because they were describing what is. And so you can see how in a sort of roundabout way, canary, uh, like paper towns can sort of work against map makers because someone will see the original map, they'll go build a store, Someone will then do a survey of the area and go, well, this store exists, so that town exists, and we'll put it on ours. So they pursued litigation, and obviously it failed because they basically couldn't prove copyright infringement. 
and that's the end of the story. A few years later, the town went out, the, the, the store went out of business and it closed down. Um, in 2014, I believe it was, finally got around to removing Google, uh, from removing Aglo from their map. Um, and they did that silently. So you've got to ask yourself where Google were getting their maps from. They were probably stealing them. So that's a nice story, but what does it tell us about protecting data in the, in the modern day? When we, when we talk about security, we often talk about things like perimeter security, defense in depth, and those sort of things. And the benefit of canaries, which we'll get into a bit more, is that they protect against these sort of situations. Because when you only have perimeter security, when you get past the out, outer, like, crunchy surface, you end up with, like, the soft, gooey center where all the secrets are and where all the users' computers are and they probably don't have endpoint protection. And it's great. It's fantastic. Um, the other thing that we often don't talk about, if you haven't seen When a Stranger Calls, I've got some bad news. There are spoilers ahead. <laughs> the other thing is, is insider threats. How do you protect against these? Um, for those of you who don't know, insider threats are people within your organization who might be stealing um, your intellectual property. Um, they could just be trying to exfiltrate data because, you know, corporate espionage is a thing. Um, we don't talk about it, but it is a thing. And that's where our Canary tokens come in. It's basically a trap. Um, when an unsuspecting hacker or, you know, one of your insider threats comes along and they interact with the, the Canary token, basically it tells you there's like, hey, there's bad things happening. And you're like, oh, no. We've got an incident. We've got to, we've got to fix this. Um, Shubbs had this really fantastic tweet. Um, basically, to, to sum it up, um, you don't know when you found a canary token or when you found legitimate credentials, especially with the AWS stuff, because you, you just can't tell. And so sometimes it's just easier to take the long, hard path instead of letting corporations know that, hey, I'm doing stuff, I'm here. Um, so I like to think of it as um, scat for hackers. Um, if you do any gardening, it's really, really good. <laughs> so when they're implemented correctly, <laughs> um, canary tokens allow you to focus on other issues within your organization, and they'll only notify you when they've been triggered. I spent way too much time making this GIF. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, there are terms and conditions that apply. Um, you can't just generate a random set of credentials and then dump them on a server somewhere, and you're like, ah, ha, ha, that's a canary token. Look at me. Um, there are actually some really important qualities that canaries need to possess to make them usable and beneficial to your company. So the anatomy of the canary. Basically, tokens need to look enticing. It's no, it's no good if, you know, they're like, do not look at me. Actually, no, if I was a hacker, I'd probably look at that. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if you make things to balance, look at me, but if you're an employee, please don't click this because I don't want to have to deal with training you more on not to look at the canary things. Um, it needs to be possible to detect when it's been used. And there's another caveat to that in that you need to make sure you actually have logging and monitoring in your organization. And we'll cover Slack Ops a little bit later. Um, without logging and monitoring or some way to aggregate that these things have been triggered, they're meaningless. It, the, the data is just going into the void. Their value comes from being able to be detected when they're, they're used. Finally, they need to be able to sing. Oh, wait, no, that was the last one. This is a different point, sorry. Um, 
The last quality that they need to have, and this is probably the most important one, is they cannot have any usage apart from detection. So if you've got a, a canary token that's, you know, credentials to log into, you know, your pager duty, if you can actually log in pager duty, that's not a canary token, that's leaking credentials. <laughs> and that's a really important thing to remember. Um, because, you, as I said, you can't just generate random credentials and hope someone comes across them and doesn't actually log in, because chances are you're going to find credentials you're going to log in. And hackers don't care how, you know, this was a canary token, I probably shouldn't have logged into this service. So I'm going to go through a couple of tools. Um, but there are lots of canary and canary-like solutions available. Um, there's also a lot of papers. This isn't new technology or new theories. Um, in 1994, there was a paper on using integrity checkers for intrusion detection. Um, and 2003, there was another one written by someone at Semantic about canary tokens in general as well. So none of the stuff that we're talking about is new. So Project Space Crabs by Atlassian gets an honourable mention. Um, it's really good for deploying on-scale AWS tokens. Um, I'll leave it up for a minute so if anyone wants to write down the link, they can. Um, but basically, it allows you to generate thousands and thousands of AWS tokens and just deploy them out across your infrastructure, which is really, really handy if you've got a lot of developers using AWS, because you can load them basically all up with a Canary token and their legitimate AWS creds. And that means that they're still protected in some way. Is it a crab in space or is the space in the crab? Um, basically, the way it works is it only allows the STS get caller identity action, which is only action that you can't actually remove from um, AWS credentials. So it has that quality of you can't do anything with it. So the one that we're primarily going to talk about today is the Canary Tokens by Thinkst Applied Research. Um, you can check out a demo at this link down there. Um, I'd highly suggest reading up a little bit more about the disclaimer they put on that. But basically, you shouldn't use their website for production like Canary tokens because you can just blacklist the, the DNS entry and then those tokens will never trigger. So it's important that if you want to use this, you set it up yourself internally. We all good? Got the pictures, wrote it down. Yep, cool. Um, and we'll talk a, a little bit about the pros and cons about this this particular thing um, a little bit later. I will tell you, though, that after I did this talk at PyCon, they did send me a T-shirt and some stickers, um, but I don't work for them, and I will still tell you what is wrong with their product. So this is my cue. Um, so really quickly, I set mine up on DigitalOcean. Um, I used the smallest instance, and I used their one-click deploy applications with Docker. Um, it basically took me maybe a day to get it up the first time. Now it takes me about half an hour. Um, of course, with real infrastructure, it's going to take a little bit longer because you need to work out where you're going to put it, how it's going to work, um, you know, what VLAN it might be in, things like that. Um, I also use PagerDuty. Um, I just use the, de uh, the development webhook because I don't have logging and monitoring infrastructure. Um, and basically, all of those notifications go to Slack. That's not how you should be doing it in production. I'm lazy. So. So basically, there's my digital ocean instance. And this is what the, the solution actually looks like. Um, takes a webhook or an email address, um, and then you just put a little comment there. This is my PagerDuty account. And you can see that there's been a lot of testing in the past few days. OK. So if, damn it, I 
need the QR code that was on the slides. Let's see. So if I get a QR code reader, and then, and then, ah, oh, computers are hard. Okay, and then if I scan that link, hopefully I'll get a canary token, maybe? No? Damn it, why did I do the live demo? <laughs> Let's generate one real quick. We've got an hour, it's fine. All right, so what we'll do is we'll make a web easy to demonstrate. <laughs> That's our note. And then we create our canary token. OK. And so I'm not too sure if you can see that. There we go. So if we take that link and then we browse to it, so you can see, I don't know if you can all see, but see the random, the random garbage in there? That's basically the token. That's the thing that says, I am unique. Um, and generally, you have a bit of control over this section and this section, especially for the, um, the URL stuff. Um, so it means that you can have some control over how it presents in like your website or wherever you're placing it. So if we go to Slack now, there are two incidents. That's great. So we can just resolve those. They're really, really underwhelming to demo. Um, <laughs> because it's like, look, here's a link. Click the link. There's an alert. Congratulations, it worked. So. so yeah, the, now you understand how they work. They're really, really simple. So what types of tokens are supported? Um, things are really good. This is one of the reasons that I like them because it's open source and they provide you with a number of options that makes it good for cross-platform use because you can use it on Linux, you can use it on Windows, you can use it on OS X. So as we saw the demo, um, we have web bugs and URLs. And so basically you can write up an email similar to this um, and basically just leave it sitting in your inbox. If anyone ever goes through and is like, oh, sweet, I'm in this person's email and they have this really confidential infrastructure information and someone clicks through, you're like, someone's going through my email. Quick question for you on that one. Yeah. Have you had these set up? So I've got some um, PM canary tokens in my Gmail, right? Yep. Now, every month or so, that gets set up. I haven't had that, but I have read a little bit about, um, especially in OS X, the window, the, the Microsoft Word ones, yeah. they can be triggered when you use File Explorer. Um, so it could, it could be something like the indexing. Um, if you want to put one into Google, like into Gmail, I would probably do the links. <laughs> Because the, the problem is, is if you're getting those false reports, you can't distinguish between whether they're real or not. And so you'll start to tune them out because you'll just be like, oh, it's another month, it's another alert. Yeah, and so you just like, it sort of defeats the purpose of it. Yeah. Um, but maybe try switching to the links. Um, you might have less issues. The, the logic there was, sorry, I won't take the but if, if you have an actual person in your account opening PDF, that gives you a higher um, yeah. confidence. Yeah, no, like, I, it's one of those ones that's really hard. Um, and I touch on this later because it used to be that you could put, like, AWS keys into your GitHub repositories yeah. to see if anyone's, like, trying to find things in your GitHub. But, of course, now that they've rolled out the, the changes, it becomes really difficult to do that because they're just going to start warning you that, hey, you've got creds. And it's like, no, but they're meant to be there. Um, but, yeah, there's a few complexities with that I... I have experienced. Yeah. Um, so you can also do email addresses. Um, so an example for this in like a development company or a production like environment is that you can put a, a fake user into like your users table. Um, and then basically you know that if that email address ever gets emailed and the canary is triggered, someone potentially has got 
that database. Of course, there's the, the downfall of if you're using that database for mailing lists, you could continuously trigger it every time you use it as a mailing list. Um, so this is where that, it depends on your environment and how you use information. So that's the example there. I'm not a database administrator, so if anyone is really upset about how this is set up, I'm sorry. <laughs> So you can also do AWS credentials. These are the best ones. Um, these can be stored in your .AWS credentials file. Um, if you use AWS on the console, um, you can do it in your private Git repositories, but not on GitHub anymore because they will alert AWS. Um, but for those of you using um, Bitbucket, GOGS, um, GitLab, you should still be right to do this. Um, it can tell you a lot of things. It can tell you if there are other users within your organization who are trying to use um, AWS credentials to potentially mask that they're doing bad, nefarious things. Um, and if you do put them in other ones, it can tell you if people are auditing your source code and looking for those sort of things. But that's not really something that you should care too much about because it is open source. People will inherently look at these things. So that's it in my AWS credentials um, as my default one, which is probably not a good way to do it because I always use the wrong one. I'm like, why is Scout not working? Why can't I audit anything? You can also have um, DNS tokens. And I like to put these in my host files. Um, so I do this mainly on my personal laptop because on my work laptop, it just messes up what I'm trying to do. Um, but an example is here. Um, so basically, if anyone saw that I was trying to access this staging.dc internal, I would get an alert um, if they ever tried to connect to that host. Um, of course, if you actually look at the host file, you'll work out pretty quickly that I've probably been told. Um, another way of using these is you can put um, a pointer entry into some dark IP space on your internal network. That way, if anyone is mass scanning that, um, you'll be able to tell. Um, and or, Well, if they're walking your network, really. Um, and then you don't need to do much more in terms of like DNS logging, which I don't think anyone really does anyway. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can chuck it in your bash history or your SSH config or in servers.txt um, to tell people all about the cool secret servers that you access. And then you also have the, the physical QR code tokens. And this is a really nice, unique thing to have. Um, the example I show you is having like a QR code in an office to access the, the free guest network. Um, and, you know, if you have a procedure where when a guest checks in with, like, reception, they get given the, the Wi-Fi details, you know that anyone who has bypassed that procedure is probably seeing this sign and going, sweet, I get free Wi-Fi access, I can hack all the things. So that's our example. <laughs> but, of course, you get a canary token instead and they get nothing. <laughs> and that's all for you, right? So obviously, like, talking about the tool is all well and good. There are some benefits and there are some inconveniences, just like every other so I'm going to talk about the main ones that I've identified while I've been sort of testing them, using them, deploying them, that sort of thing. So they have a low signal-to-noise ratio, which is really good because when they're deployed correctly, and I emphasize the word correctly, you basically shouldn't hear from them unless something has gone terribly wrong. They can be complex to deploy on established systems. And so that depends on a lot of variables. If you've got a larger system with a lot more going on, it's probably going to be a lot harder for you to work out where you want to put this, where the information is going to go, where you're going to aggregate it, how it's going to get there, and all of those things. Um, but 
it does integrate well with existing structure. And you're like, but how can I have those two things? Because once you get past deployment, because it does have so many different things supported, basically no matter what you're running, you will be able to find some way to, to, to deploy canary tokens into your existing system network. Um, again, that always depends on your existing infrastructure and things like that. The downside is that canaries only give you very limited visibility to what's going on. They're not a substitute for actually monitoring network traffic and things like that. Um, they don't offer a complete view. They only give you like a very microscopic idea of what's going on. So someone is on that box and they're playing with these files or databases and that's all you sort of know. And they're, they're almost like antivirus in some way because if, they, if the canary token has been triggered, chances are this person has been there for a while um, because you're only just finding it now and it means that they've probably touched something that they shouldn't have, which is, of course, the whole point. Um, but you don't know how long they've been there mapping, just poking around, and now they're sort of going, OK, I've sort of got a feel for what's going on. And so that's one of the risks that you do sort of take. Um, and that's also why it's really important to sort of layer your canaries. Don't just put one on each host that you put one of these things on. Put multiple. Put them in different places. Give them different looks and feels. That way hackers don't really know what they're in for. It's supplied as a dock container, which is really, really good until it's not. Um, if you're not a docker shop, this, this is, can be really, really daunting to deal with. Um, I'm not a Docker person, and so I was like, surely I can just build this from scratch. No, don't, don't go down that path. I promise you it will be painful. Um, so, yeah, like you need to, to assess internally whether using Docker is something that you want to do. Um, I do highly recommend trying to look past that and just deploying it and having a go um, because I know... People who don't like Docker, they tend to really not like Docker and there's no persuading them otherwise. Hopefully this sort of gets you on the good side. Um, the, the solution is free. Um, they do have a paid one, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the free one. Um, and some of the research is open source. Um, the Docker is open source. The actual solution itself um, for the canary tokens is open source, so you can see exactly what's going on. You can do your code analysis, audits, things like that. Um, yeah, and it's really easy to change things and make them better for your own company because you can have the code. It's fantastic. Um, this is the one thing that bothered me the most. There's currently no support for Git canaries, um, only SVN. Um, someone did ask them about this after my talk at PyCon, and they did say that they did have one, but they've retired it and that they are working on a newer one. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. They have been updating the open source stuff recently. They did go on a bit of a hiatus for a while. And, of course, it supports physical tokens, which you don't get in a lot of solutions like this. Um, and the physical tokens also make it really good for personal use. Um, you can whack one on the back of your phone. If you're going through international borders, if it gets triggered, someone might be looking at your phone and stuff when they probably shouldn't be. Um, yeah, you can chuck them on your desk, chuck them on your laptop, just stick them on everything. Basically, if you ever get an alert on one, you know someone's being a sticky nose. This is one of the other problems, is not all the tokens can be meaningfully renamed. So remember how I showed you in the, the web URL there was that rubbish in there? The problem is, is that the Word documents are called that rubbish. Um, so that makes them really, really useless sometimes. Um, one of the things that you can do, though, as um, an alternative, is you can embed um, some image bugs into Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, um, slideshows, um, and that makes it a lot easier. You can also put your, your link in there like you normally would, um, and so that means that you don't have to have garbagely named files. HTTPS is supported with Let's Encrypt. 
hooray. Um, it does mean that if you're using it for personal use, you can set it up for HTTPS. Um, it also means that all should be doing. Uh, this is a problem that I recently fixed, so it's not so much a down anymore, it's more of an up. Um, so there's no inbuilt authentication for that generate page we looked at. Um, if you're using this for personal use and you've got it on a digital ocean droplet, that is probably an issue because you don't want randoms finding your website and creating their own tokens. Um, the really good thing is you can, figure, you can configure Nginx to block access to the interfaces, but not to the traffic. Um, and it's really, if, if you know Nginx, it's relatively simple to do. Um, for those who don't know Nginx, I've provided a handy example. Um, so this is basically the for one of the pages. Um, and you can see that I've added these two entries, allow and deny. And so what you do is basically, if you only want to be able to access this from your like home IP address, you go and check what that is, and then you just deny everything else. Um, so the way I did it was I only allowed it from my phone, um, my home internet. Um, we also have a bit of a weird configuration where we have a static IP, so it, mileage may vary, um, and then basically everything else was denied. But because I was only blocking the actual pages, all of the traffic kept coming through without any issue. Why would you want to do that? I just went through why we would want to do that. Um, so canary tokens alone won't keep you secure or equipment for logging and monitoring. Um, they can help you improve your security posture and they can help you protect your data because you will be told when someone is poking around in places that they shouldn't be. So let's really quickly talk about Slack Ops. Does anyone here use Slack for their primary logging and monitoring stuff? <laughs> I'm on to you. Um, so Slack isn't proper logging or monitoring. Um, if you're re relying on Slack, I've got some bad news, but you need to consider investing in things like Datadog, Splunk, or rolling your own Elasticsearch um, instances. Um, even if you blah. even if you are doing logging and monitoring, you need to consider how much of that is noise, because it's fine to have some of that information going to Slack so people can keep an eye on it, but consider how much of that can condensed into dashboards instead. Because chances are things like, you know, hard disk space running out, that doesn't need to be a Slack message. So that can be presented on a dashboard. And if you start presenting dashboards instead of constantly logging everything into Slack, you're going to have people actually paying attention when things go ding. Because things don't normally go ding. Maybe I should be paying attention. And people won't mute channels as much. When I was doing op stuff, that was the first channel I muted. Because it'd always be the thing that's like, hey, look at me, look at Slack. And you'd look at it and it's just like, I don't need to know about this stuff. And so by reassessing and making more dashboards over, but don't make all everything dashboards. Actually consider what data you need. Um, You'll reduce log fatigue and you'll reduce muted channels and your ops people and your developers will probably thank you for it. Um, but yeah, basically, if you're using canaries and you don't have logging or monitoring, again, it's useless. I will keep repeating this. So finally, um, if you don't have an incident response plan, it's really important to consider one. Um, it doesn't need to be like a 200-page policy or procedure um, because even if you've tabletop something and just played out some generic scenarios of what happens when, you know, a DNS canary goes off, what happens if, you know, we're ransomware, in the back of your mind, at least have an idea of what needs to be done next because when things happen, you're never prepared for it. 
And it means that your response to these things is going to take much longer and you're going to suffer much larger consequences um, because it will take you longer to recover from these things. Um, so yeah, it can just be like a really informal Friday night game with all of your employees, not just your developers, not just your ops people, not just your developers and ops people. Get your finance team involved because they deal with a lot of spam and malicious links and things like that. And they can have a really good perspective on these things because part of their job is very much risk analysis, which is what a lot of security and this sort of thing involves. So this is the TLDR. Um, if you've like sort of tuned out the last hour or half an hour, I can't tell the time. So no canaries were harmed in the making of this slide deck. I can't say the same for servers. Do I have any questions? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, depending on what you're protecting against, this can have two very different answers. Um, if your concern is insider threats, you probably don't want to tell everyone that you've littered canaries throughout your environment. Um, you probably only want to inform those people that need to know and keeping like a, a protected Excel spreadsheet, something with the names of your canaries. Um, again, that depends on like what sort of insider threat you're dealing with um, and how you're dealing with that internally. It's a really rare scenario, I would hope. Um, more generally, though, if you're just protecting against bad people getting into your environment, um, probably having something like a shared protected workbook where you don't save the password in plain text, um, that would be really good. Um, but to answer the question, like, it can be a little bit hard depending on how you manage your own sort of password management and file management because you need to have this list of protected information, but you need a password for that and you need that password, but how do you share that in a secure way so then the bad people don't get it? Um, and so you sort of need to work. you need to find what works for you, but at the bare minimum, do not save the password in plain text and leave it on your desktop called password.txt because I can tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> Macros enabled. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, when you do the emailing, because I didn't do the, the um, pager duty stuff properly, the email is the best one that I have to go off. Um, there it is. Um, so you do, the, the benefit is, is you do get a little bit of information from it, especially the most important part is this canary token. And so you can sort of isolate the things happening between the canary going off and your traffic, but that depends on what you're actually logging. Um, if you're not really logging much and, you know, you've had a DNS query, uh, you've had a DNS canary go off, but you're not logging anything else around, you can't really correlate what was going on there because you don't have more information. And that could be a time where it's beneficial to go, hey, was anyone scanning? Like, was anyone scanning that internal space? Um, and if you are dealing with the bad people option, um, yeah, just saying, hey, was anyone doing this specific activity? Maybe not tell them why, but just try and get a general feel for what was going on in your organisation before that happened. From there, you can deem whether to escalate or to mark it as a, um, 
as a false positive. And maybe at that point, if you are deeming it a false positive, maybe doing some more training around, hey, we've deployed these things into our environment. We need to be really careful not to set them off. But again, that also comes back down to making sure you're placing them right. And so that's why they can be, they can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. You want them everywhere, but at the same time, if you put them everywhere, everyone's going to trigger them. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, though. Like, it's one of those really complicated things because no one is ever really logging. They're ever logging too much or not enough. And so to suggest... To suggest that they use canary tokens is always like, oh, this could go really wrong. And then they could be like, you gave us bad advice. And it's like, no, you, you're doing it wrong. Um, yeah. 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 Sort of shut down the because of that? At the minute, like, I only... Um, and not really. I know that if something goes off, I'm just like, uh-oh. Um, because I've got one I've got one in my Google Drive, um, and that's just a Word document with some links in it, so I know if anyone's going through my documents and they click through one of those links. Um, and I generally name them, like, you know, GitLab admin panel. Um, and I've never had a problem, but someone... What was your name? Oh, Gareth, sorry. Gareth. I've got another question for you about this. Okay. <laughs> um, as he mentioned, he has some documents in Gmail that have been triggering canaries, probably for no reason, <laughs> but at the same time, how do you know? Actually, that's a question. Did you change your password after the canary was triggered? <laughs> the thing, right? When you follow the link to the canary, it shows you where it originated from. Right? Yeah. So Ah, uh, yeah. So, like, it could just be a false positive then. Very likely. Yeah. This is the thing that got me though. Like, so it's in, the index of the index of the trigger, it still had to be open. So something, it, it gave me a different yeah. information. Not what I wanted, but it was Yeah. What was your name? Pardon? Lyndon. Gareth, Lyndon has just said that it could also be vulnerability scanning the PDFs. Yeah. And so it could be... Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like you have examples like that where it could be a false positive, but how much do you trust Google? Not again. Um, but how much do you trust Google? Like, that's, <laughs> I'm not starting that debate. We're not having that conversation. <laughs> you wear a tinfoil hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you like, we can continue talking about this. <laughs> um, I'll take the one at the back first. Is it a good idea to document the entire category project? If it's against hackers, yes. If it's against insider threats, make sure the document cannot be the, seen by the person that you think is the problem. Um, but yes, I am 100% for documentation. Um, it means that people who come after you know what's going on. It means people who are helping you know what's going on, especially naming conventions or um, descriptions, because I put, my to uh, I put my token reminders as example. That's really good. It tells me nothing when it goes off. Uh, so having clear documentation around those things, I always encourage that. Chris? Uh, can canaries be configured to not um, trigger an alert from certain sources? So if you have a box which performs vulnerability scans, that IP address not cause the alert? Um, or at least in the fixed ones? The fixed ones can't do that because that just takes a webhook. Um, if you're doing vulnerability scanning, that would probably come down to your monitoring tool and maybe telling it for the next 24 hours we're not going to monitor this webhook. Um, but then it requires a bit of future thought about knowing that you're probably going to vulnerability scan things. Um, so it comes down to probably your monitoring configuration more than anything. Um, I saw a question here. Um, trigger scan, many scans, like do they get people? 
you had some fun with the Google scan? I have had few problems with them, but that doesn't mean they don't. Um, as I mentioned on OSX, sometimes the way it renders like Word documents, um, it can cause problems because it'll trigger them when it's showing you the preview, um, especially I think if you have the images embedded. Um, and if you're doing like a brute force on a website, like you're scanning your own website, you've got one of the um, URLs. If a spider follows it, it'll trigger it. Um, so it really does sort of depend on what you're doing in your environment and how you manage it, uh, how you manage your monitoring. Um, if you know that you're scanning, just disable those. Um, feeling, no, that's not paper duty. I set up Peter Judy to call me sometimes. Um, but so that can be, that really, now you're doing the monitoring. I meant, I meant more in terms of, I'm, we'll pick it up the same, is it something malicious? Oh, no, in my experience, never happened. Um, because like if you're using the image ones, it just it just shows up as an image and it thinks that it's broken. Um, there's nothing really that most scanners these days are configured to pick up. Um, it might pick up that you know you've got hashes or things like that. Um, if you're using burp and you're spidering a website. Um, but yeah. Uh, things like EDRs might pick it up. Oh. Something like CrowdStrike if you're running that internally. Yep. and it's scanning through a document and it's linking oh. out to a remote resource, then it might get picked up and alerted on those. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, there was a question over here. Was it you before? I saw this one and I saw another one in the corner of my eye. I'll go with your... Uh, no, let's go with this one first. <laughs> yes? How do you stop them from getting triggered accidentally? Education. It's, it's, um, it's the similar problem that we have with don't click links in emails. If you get an email, don't click the link. You just need to tell people um, not to click or to use them. Or if you have like a naming convention that you use that doesn't involve the word canary or token, um, that's always a good one. Um, but the other thing that you need to be aware of if you're doing canary naming conventions is it can't be too different from your normal naming convention because people, if people come in and they're like, these are named differently, one of them is not right. You've just got to be aware of that. So the primary way is just education. Um, you know, telling people don't click on things that have, you know, dot RTM or something like that. Um, yeah, that's the only real way um, is clear communication, documentation um, and things like that. Yep, yep, um, and like that's why you can sort of go to a naming convention, um, but at the same time you've got to think about where you're putting them. Why are you putting them in really populated areas? Is there somewhere higher up that less people are going to access them? Is that maybe a better spot? Um, yeah, those are your two sort. Uh, those are your sort of three best options. Um, if anyone else has suggestions, though, I'm keen to. Yeah. 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 The modelling process. Yeah. Yeah. Before you deploy, the modelling process by which you're most likely to get a high value signal, mm -hmm. and then deploy accordingly. Because otherwise, you're going to drag yourself in noise. It's another use. Yeah. It's okay. Um, I will go with the question here. Um, a lot of this is all web driven. Um, do you have the, does this have an option to, to store a more traditional set of username and credentials off the link so trigger off? I want something to store in our admin password databases that people will try and log into. I ask the space program guys the same thing. Yeah, no, like this this one doesn't. Um, but if you are in control of the web application, you can always create your own user that has absolutely no permissions. Um, it could even be that you, it, it's a lot of work, but you could always program in a route that if this account does log in, you route them off to somewhere weird um, and you log on that incident happening. Um, 
that's the only real thing that I can think of doing because, like, the problem with canary tokens is that they don't have any way for you, like, even if you did have a username and password that it could generate, you put that into your web app and it will follow the normal flow of a user registered. Um, but yeah, if you're in control of the web application, you can always make a Canary user um, and sort of model some flows and activities to happen if that account does get logged into. But I was worried about my, my password database. Oh, your password database. Yeah, you could always put like AWS keys in there. Um, yeah. There's, again, like you could, yeah, that's the only thing that I can think of. Or you could use the, the web URL um, and put like, you could host your own rubbish interface there. And then if someone logs in, if someone browses to that URL, you've got them even before they try anything. Yeah, does that answer? Yeah. Anyone else? Actually? Yeah. Um, can you ask the question again? Yep. I think it depends. Um, like, canaries give you the benefit of being much more flexible in what they can do. Um, and because you control what's going on, it means that you can basically see everything that happens. Um, like, with Google Analytics, you can't necessarily monitor everything internally because you would need to have some way for that information to get back out. Whereas with this solution, you can host it internally and nothing has to go out to the cloud, especially if you're running your own monitoring um, and logging stuff, because it all runs. But do you really want plausible deniability? Like, you want to own up to things happening. I'm on the side of, like, you know, you should be telling your customers that things, bad things have happened. So I don't know if you would really think plausible deniability is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're not satisfied with that answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Um, Ashwin cool. is starting off.